Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can talk about borderline personality disorder treatment in terms of the big picture, what we call in mental health counseling, the life course perspective, taking into account the course of the disorder throughout the lifespan and thinking about treatment in those terms. Another question I've heard kind of related to this is, what is meant by the term stage four borderline personality disorder, and is this a real occurrence? So let's first take a look at borderline personality disorder, specifically the definition we see in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We see that there are nine symptom criteria for this disorder. Frantic efforts to avoid abandonment, an unstable relationship pattern, identity disturbance, so difficulties with self-image, impulsivity in at least two areas that could be self-damaging, suicidal behavior, affective instability, so difficulty regulating emotions, a chronic feeling of emptiness, inappropriate or intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, and paranoid ideation or severe dissociation. Borderline personality disorder, I'll just refer to this as BPD, is a severe mental disorder. It has a profound negative effect on personal, social, and work functioning. Not only just a profound effect, though, it's also an effect that has an extended duration. So, profound and extended. And this really speaks back to the life course perspective, considering its order in terms of the negative outcomes that occur over the lifespan. To some extent, some of the symptoms may come and go throughout a person's life when talking about BPD, but overall the disorder and its associated negative outcomes are chronic. BPD is associated with a number of negative outcomes throughout the lifespan, reduced quality of life, increased mortality, so reduced life expectancy, an increased risk of comorbid mental disorders like generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, substance use disorder, and eating disorders, to name just a few, and we see an increased risk of physical illness. We also see a variety of financial risks to someone who has the disorder and to society in general. Individuals with BPD typically have trouble obtaining and maintaining employment, and it's associated with lost productivity. From society's point of view, BPD leads to a disproportionately high financial cost when compared to other mental disorders. Access to mental health care for individuals with BPD is somewhat limited. BPD tends to be resistant to treatment, full recovery from BPD, particularly from the social and job perspectives, is not common. And for many people, even after experiencing gains from initial treatment, the rate of relapse is high. Making things even more complicated, it appears that different treatments are more appropriate for BPD early in life as opposed to the disorder later in life. Treatment needs to address some of the longer-term risks of the disorder and not just the immediate symptoms. So essentially, mental health counselors need to consider the chronic course of BPD when planning treatment. So what is the course of this disorder? Well, there will be individual differences, but overall, here's what we see. If somebody develops the disorder in middle adolescence, which is fairly common, they're gonna see an increase in the typical symptoms of the disorder, like self-harm, impulsivity, identity disturbance, and emotional dysregulation. As they move into young adulthood, many of those symptoms tend to diminish. BPD in young people is more prevalent, and it's associated with higher levels of distress as compared to BPD in adults. As an adult with BPD ages, we see that the symptoms generally decrease. Spontaneous remission occurs in somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of people with BPD. Almost everybody with BPD will experience at least one temporary remission at some point during their lives. So considering how devastating BPD is, it seems like really good news that some of the symptoms tend to decline. And of course, that is true. The problem here is that the decrease in symptoms 
represents a change in just one part of the disorder. The core features of the disorder tend to persist throughout the lifespan and maintain their association with impaired functioning. We see symptoms like anger, interpersonal relationship difficulties, emotional dysregulation, the feeling of emptiness, and the fear of abandonment tend to stay around. They tend to be persistent. We also see a shift towards somatic, passive-aggressive, and depressive symptoms as somebody with this disorder ages, symptoms that may not align with the diagnostic criteria. So because people are no longer meeting the diagnostic criteria for the disorder, there's this idea that they're getting better, but it could be that the symptoms are just changing a bit. Some researchers have made the argument that the BPD criteria, the ones I mentioned earlier, the nine symptom criteria, are no longer valid or they're less valid in older age. The vast majority of participants in research surrounding BPD are under age 50. Others have made the argument that there may be such a thing as a late onset personality disorder, which of course for many years has been widely rejected. I think it's too early to say that we do see late onset personality disorders, but there's some evidence out there that maladaptive personality traits may combine with different situations, so we may first detect a personality disorder late in life. So with all this in mind, what can be done? How can mental health counselors be more effective in treating BPD? Well, there are some interesting theories, including the clinical staging theory that I'll get to here in this part of the video. We see that BPD tends to change a lot over the lifespan. So some theorists believe that the dimensional model should be used instead of the categorical model. That's one of the theories. So the categorical model essentially says either somebody has the disorder or they don't. The dimensional model looks at personality characteristics instead, like the five-factor model, and really scores somebody based on those different dimensions. So it's more difficult to learn the dimensional model, but it may have more value in terms of treatment planning. Other ideas to treat BPD would include frequent reassessment to catch changes in the symptoms and levels of functioning. We see the idea that we should accept that long-term treatment is usually indicated. So something like 20 to 40 weeks of treatment, which is fairly common, just doesn't make sense when it comes to BPD. There's also this idea that we should identify the disorder early and intervene early, but don't intervene more than necessary. And this really kind of brings us to the idea of the clinical staging model of BPD, including the idea that there could be such a thing as a stage four BPD presentation. So the clinical staging model, of course, is most associated with oncology, but we see similar models used with autism and psychosis. So it's not unheard of to use this model in the world of mental health treatment. So here are the stages from one clinical staging model that's available in a popular study. And I'll put the reference to that article in the description for this video. So with this particular model, we see that stage zero is premorbid BPD, nonspecific symptoms related to self-regulation and interpersonal functioning. So here we might see some irritability, some relational aggression, but no clinical diagnosis. In terms of the effect, we would see a limited effect on some social and school functioning areas. The next stage is stage one. This is considered sub-threshold BPD. So we might see something like impulsivity, some affective symptoms, mood swings, and difficulty managing temper. But these symptoms will be limited in terms of frequency, duration, and severity. We may also see some symptoms of other mental disorders like conduct disorder. The problems here would be emerging in different areas of the person's life like at home and social settings and at school. Now moving to stage two, this is threshold. So stage two is when somebody meets the full criteria for borderline personality disorder, including the four core areas. So affect regulation, impulsivity, identity, and interpersonal functioning. We would also expect here to see some comorbidity and a moderate to severe impact on functioning. Stage three would be chronic. So this would be more than two years of duration of the full criteria being met or recurrent episodes of borderline personality disorder. So here we would see chronic and severe comorbidity and associated physical illnesses in many cases. 
In terms of impairment, we would see severe and chronic impairment with little or no recovery. And that moves us to stage four, and this is considered irreversible. So this would be chronic, full borderline personality disorder with severe problems in all areas with no relapse and no remission. So we would see multiple comorbid disorders, possibly psychosis would be in there, and a high likelihood of physical illness. We would see no participation in social or professional life. Now, these stages, of course, are just theorized. We don't know how these would really line up with BPD without a lot of research. And of course, some of them are quite discouraging, like the stage four BPD, the idea that the disorder could be irreversible and the symptoms could be this severe, essentially, for a person's entire life. As to the question about whether stage four BPD really exists, I've certainly seen presentations of BPD that are so severe across so many domains, it becomes challenging to imagine a substantial recovery. But these types of presentations represent a small percentage of the population affected by BPD. We don't have enough research about any type of clinical staging model for BPD, but I do appreciate that borderline personality disorder is dynamic in nature. It tends to change over time. Mental health counselors in some way need to address this phenomenon to provide the best treatment, considering all of the developmental and contextual factors, as well as the other features of the disorder. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media, all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. Learn more at arslonga.media.